Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, timeless investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focused Compounding. Back again today on the number one value investing podcast in the world, soon to be the number one YouTube value investing channel in the world as well. Sitting next to you, my co-founder, Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It is going great. Somebody tweeted at me the other day. They mm-hmm. said, hold on, no more coffee for you. They told me to slow down in the intro. And Maybe I told them, I need to have more coffee. I yes. told them three cups of coffee is the minimum required for me to record a podcast. Which of, which of the two of us drinks more coffee? You do. Jeff <laughs> drinks coffee like I drink water. <laughs> so how, this many is, cups, how many cups a day do you drink? me with coffee. Yeah, how many cups a day? Well, Jeff's feeling a little under the weather. Give him a little break. Right, that's true. But if, what, how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? No way to tell. A lot. He at least drinks one pot a day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's all he drinks is coffee. And you don't really even drink soda. Just just coffee. I don't actually drink anything with calories. It's not an intentional health thing. It just yeah. happens that way. Yeah. That's all he drinks is coffee. I'm drinking a Celsius right now, which they're a public company. Yes, they are. I drink yep. probably like two of these a day. You actually mm-hmm. got me hooked on them. Yes. Because we met well, with somebody in New York City mm-hmm. who asked us about this company. Yep. And we tried it, and I like it a lot. Mm-hmm. It's got good caffeine. I don't even know how much is in here. It's a ton of caffeine compared to yeah, like 200, 200 milligrams, milligrams of caffeine, which yeah, for people who don't know, that's a lot compared to normal energy drinks. People are like, oh my gosh, yeah. no wonder you're so amped up <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you don't love the taste of like coffee with other stuff in it. Yeah. I drink coffee for the function. Yeah. I don't like, I kind of like the taste of yeah, coffee. Jeff, yeah. Well, you're like my, my father. I always make fun of him because he drinks decaf coffee. Oh yeah. And I'm like, what's the point? Right. He's like, I've just been drinking it for so long. I, yeah, I like the taste of happens, it. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, weirdo. All right. I'm judging you. And everybody that drinks decaf, I'm just kidding. But peach for this stuff is good celsius and they're a public company which we looked at because it's, public it's an overlooked stock if you look at the financials though you'd understand why we haven't talked about them yeah. i'm not saying their product isn't great and that they might not be a great stock but they're hard to analyze for the way that we yeah. kind of do things they're yeah. very early stages good stuff well this is the first time that you were tuning in with us help us become the number one youtube investing value investing channel on youtube by hitting that subscribe button views are up subscriptions are up and we're going to take over youtube so hit that subscribe button thumbs this video up leave us a comment we're trying to hack that youtube algorithm um, and we're definitely thankful for all the support that we are receiving 172 podcasts which is pretty crazy having a lot of fun doing it if you are going to be in omaha the week of may 2nd which is uh the berkshire hathaway annual meeting we're going to be there. Reach out to me, Andrew at focuscompound.com. Uh, we're looking to meet with potential investors who are just interested in learning about our process and everything that we are doing. Uh, so definitely reach out to me, Andrew at focusedcompounding.com. Also, if you like research, Jeff writes on Focus Compounding, him and other members. I'm a slacker. Um, and this is a stock A to Z section, mm-hmm. which is a, probably the most important section of the website uh, where you can get a bunch of this probably, I don't know, a hundred different companies on here and all the research that is associated that has been written up on Focus Compounding. So I definitely check it out. Go yet? Uh, I did actually last night. So okay. yeah, I did a so good job. Gainsco's there we go. Yeah. Gainsco. So we're going to be talking about Gainsco, which is Do a- Do you want to pull up the write-up of Gainsco too, uh, just in case? I sure can. This right. set was sent out in the uh, Gannon Gazette yesterday, but it was not a free email. Okay. Not a free write-up. So people are seeing behind the scenes right now. Mm-hmm. Gainsco, a dark, non-standard auto insurer that's cheap based on recent underwriting results. This is an overlooked stock that we are going to be going over. So we'll talk about, uh, we're going to go through Jeff's marked up 10K of Gainsco from over 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Right? <laughs> and then we'll kind of do a little bit more recent. But a lot of people like the um, going through a bank 10K. Yeah, so this so is basically we'll hit the of, insurance. As yeah, well. the idea is educational about how to look at insurance. Not that people are actually going to be interested in Gainsco, and certainly not that things from ten years ago are helpful. But I did just write up insurer, and people seem interested. You know, the process is the same for any insurer, really. Yep. In the ten k. Yep. So yep. if you want to get access to this uh, research and other research on the website, use the podcast promo code, which is podcast, and I'll take the price from sixty dollars a month down to fifty dollars. And then we do also have a discounted annual membership as yeah. well, which is so like hugely. Off. It's yeah, a it's pretty. 
who, whose decision was that? I don't even know. But anyways, let's we're jump. not changing it. So. No, we're not. All right, let's jump into it. Yeah, today when we were at our morning meeting, we were going over some stuff and we're like, wow, that's a pretty big discount. If you do if you do $60 yeah. a month for 12, for 12 months, that's a pretty good discount. So uh, that's been kind of interesting. But anyway, so Gaines Co., let's see if I could somehow make this a better, let's see, read screen mode. Okay. Hopefully this looks okay. Hopefully it does. Maybe not. Okay, we'll do it like that. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So we'll try to make it as um, you know interactive as possible for people listening right. on the podcast as well. So this is obviously uh, Gainsco Inc. This is their 10K from, from about 2009. 10 so yes. this is a long time ago. They went dark shortly after this. When we say they went dark, we mean they stopped filing with the SEC because it's like an insurer. It continues to file with its um, regulator. And just like banks continue to file with the uh, FDIC call reports, you with insurers can see all this information and Gainsco helpfully puts it on their um, website. So yeah. Yeah, they actually also give you gap financials, gap and statutory are a little different, mm -hmm. but we're going to do the 10K because for most insurers, almost all the ones you're going to be looking at, they file a 10K. Yeah. So state of incorporation, obviously good to know, uh, Texas, yep. they are a Texas sure that's, company. that's normal that you would see it incorporated in the state that it does business. Should, Dallas, Texas, should I tell them I'm, I'm like five minutes away? People I think gonna, it's okay. People are going to find out where I live. I'm five we've, minutes away. I, we've given away more information about where I live. <laughs> and it was an Amex stock. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So why did they go dark? Um, they have a small number of shareholders. They claim that like 71% of their shares are owned by directors and insiders and stuff. I would say it's closer to 80% by my math uh, by about three people who seem to be connected to each other uh, and connected to Fort Worth to um, would participate in a recapitalization of the company in the like 2005 era. So got it. Yep. Okay. So going over, so just save uh, money and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it was a $20 million market cap. So at the time, this mm -hmm. is a very small company. Uh, well it's, was it $20 million or $20 million of non-affiliates, 20 million of non-affiliates. So the large shareholders wouldn't count towards that. Oh, got so it. So got yeah. It. So they're probably, the I SEC is given guidance on what an affiliate really is, but I'll tell you that almost all companies just say anyone who owns more than 10% of our stock yeah. is an affiliate. Mm -hmm. Um, the SEC has said that's not really true, but companies ignore that so mm -hmm. companies i think brokers i think everyone just acts like anyone who owns 10 percent or more is definitely an affiliate even yeah. if they can't um, and that's like a newer thing yeah even if they can't have anything to do with um or uh with really changing the actions of the company mm -hmm. and stuff yeah 4.7 million shares outstanding yep that and that's true back then so. it hasn't changed that much actually since mm -hmm. then. Got it. So. What are the key things that you look for typically in insurance companies? Right. So the first things that we looked at is when were they organized? So yep. we found out in 1978. What yep. were they? Um, and then what were they? What do they focus on? So they talk about that. Mm -hmm. So property and casualty is a huge business, right? So we care about what specifically they're in. And they say right there, they're focused on the non-standard personal auto market. So non-standard personal auto, you know, I would guess they may say it in this 10K is maybe a fifth of all drivers, one out of five, something like that. And then it, so there's three categories really. There's standard, there's preferred, and there's non-standard. Two of the biggest in insurance companies in the U.S. are Progressive and Geico. Mm -hmm. And Geico started on the one side in the preferred area because it stands for government employees, right? Um, and then Progressive actually started on the non-standard side of it. So the we'd say higher risk side. I was going to say, so it's like going from like... Subprime, like good high right. quality to more of like a subprime type right. risk. Yeah. And then they move towards each other. And in fact, sometimes they use credit scores. In fact, many insurers use credit scores. Gainsco doesn't, I believe it says. But um, many insurers do use um, credit scores as part of it. And generally people with low credit mm -hmm. scores have... Um, uh, are more likely to be in the non-standard. Yeah, and they're describing their, and a lot of this is still true today, even though this is old, but they're describing their type of customer. These drivers typically seek minimum required insurance coverage as required by state law and generally pay higher premiums um, than for standard policies. Right, and non-standard could be a lot of different things. Um, some things that would definitely get you non-standard is like DUIs. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a totally different risk that you suddenly have versus other things. It, it can be other stuff too. Um, uh, seeking the minimum coverage sometimes could be uh, a sign mm -hmm. of, of certain stuff too. And we'll get into that too. Also the retention rates and stuff are totally different if you're seeking the minimum coverage. That's part of the problem that like progressive has, I think is that preferred customers and stuff tend to also be people who have very high retention rates. They're more likely to be married people, stable, whatever people who are non-standard, I think are going to tend to be people who might cancel the policy, who might honestly not pay gains. Who gets into that, that a huge number of their people at least 10 years ago just didn't make a payment mm. and so if they don't make a payment um then then their uh insurance lapses sure yeah mm -hmm. 
They talk about the markets that they're in, Florida, mm -hmm. Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Nevada, New Mexico, South Carolina, Texas, and California. Yep. And then they say why they did. They selected mm -hmm. those states based on historical levels of industry profitability, competitive landscapes, and demographic characteristics. I think by demographic characteristics, they mean two things, that the states are growing and that they're heavily Spanish-speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why'd you get that impression? Because they, they just... basically say it later. Okay. Um, but I got that impression from other things that I've read about the company. Got it. And uh, little things I might know about the non-standard. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not an expert on insurance at all, and I'm not an expert on non-standard yeah. um, auto insurance or anything specifically. But you know, and when we talk about insurance, about you have said in the past that you don't like life insurance type of companies. It's usually... insurers are the same as banks for me. I would love for us, um, like we have a fund, for instance, to always own the, my favorite insurer or my favorite bank. I think that the best run bank that you can find, the best run insurer you can find, has more upside in the long run and more durability than like any business out there. Um, it, it amplifies management skills, right? Because you control a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. However, I think the average insurer is a bad business. And I think the average bank is a bad business. I've said that. Like the average small town bank in America is not a good business. The industry overall isn't that great. Um, the in insurance overall isn't that great. We could show reports on combined ratios. Uh, for instance, for the last 10 years, I know that the liability side, now there's a liability side and there's a property side of uh, personal auto in the U.S. has always had a combined ratio over 100. Okay. And can you explain combined ratios for those yeah. that do not know? So combined ratio is... We're, um, we're tacking a new market on YouTube, so let's go. Okay. Educate. So, so combined ratio is just how insurers talk. They kind of talk the same way that railroads talk, where the railroads talk about their expenses as a percentage of their revenues, basically. And insurers work the same way. They talk about their premiums that they have, and then they do two things, which is they talk about the expense ratio and the um, loss ratio, and then they add the two together. Um, and it can be very informative. In fact, uh, I have a paper here that we didn't put in here that basically is the, what happened to Gainsco after they went dark. And what's very interesting to me about it is how much their loss ratio improved. Their expense ratio didn't improve at all. So, um, you know, a company like Geico or Progressive or something might try to get a very low expense ratio, mm -hmm. and then you can have a higher loss ratio, and you're okay there. So, like, if your expense ratio, like in the case of Gainsco, now it's like 30%. Um, if it's that high, then someone who has a 20% expense ratio could have higher losses, and so they could underprice you in terms of the premiums and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you typically like to see? So, if you're or does it depend on the business, it the depends. nature of the business? It depends. So like with scale and stuff, we're usually talking expense ratio, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if it, and that's kind of the advantage in a lot of things. If we were talking about life insurance or something, I'd have to imagine it's the expense ratio that's going to be your advantage, like um, in that sort of thing. Like maybe it's group life insurance stuff for corporations and things through them that it's how you're distributing. Something that like gets you lower costs, right? So mm -hmm. like goes direct, progressive for half their business or something goes direct. Um, gains goes all, all through agents. Uh, but then for the law stuff, the more special the businesses that you're doing, and this isn't that special, this is just non-standard auto, but uh, like I invest in company bank insurance and stuff, we talked a little bit more about how that was more of a specialty thing. Um, I really care about the loss ratio a lot in those kinds of cases mm -hmm. because you might have skills over time for decades of writing these particular lines of business that other people don't have. So you can find things, I mean, there are companies that write insurance for private investigators and summer camps and all sorts of different things. Um, I actually knew someone who, uh, would go and he worked in a very specific part of a giant company, but they did some very specific stuff that he worked in that very special stuff. And he actually would go to places where they were doing nuclear stuff. Oh, wow. So where they were doing like, um, th so refueling of things and stuff. And all that I remember that was funny about it, or not funny or whatever, is it was like, oh, so you're like the risk that they might die or something. He said, oh, no, we're not concerned about them dying. We're concerned about living the rest of their life and we're having to pay, the, <laughs> we're having to pay their medical bills, you know, from uh, something that happens with radiation that they're exposed to, right? Yeah. So that would be very long that <laughs> they'd be paying for the rest of their life, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But so there are things like that. There's all sorts of coverage for very special stuff. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that's pretty well established, which is non-standard auto. It's required by law, right? And there are the minimums that you have. It's it's a huge business. Like even just in Texas or something, we're talking about something that, um, you know, auto insurance. I mean, you can do the math. So you can figure, don't say it on, you don't have to say it here, but you can figure how much you spend every um, month on premiums mm -hmm. right, for your auto insurance. Probably you can figure out 
what percent of the U.S. Texas represents. If you don't know the population of Texas, you can guess as to how many drivers there are. I probably know how many drivers are in Texas. Multiply it through, you get a number oh, yeah? of many, how, many, how many drivers are there in Texas? Many, huh? many billions, <laughs> many, many billions of dollars that we're talking about just for auto insurance premiums in Texas alone. Sure. Because Texas is as big as many countries. And you could go over, you know, the markets that they're in. Florida, right? That's mm-hmm. pretty, New Mexico, South Carolina, Texas, yeah. California. So Those today, are all their markets. two big markets are Texas and South Carolina. Uh-huh. Yeah. Got it. Um, they talk about their gross premiums total. This is back in 2009 being 179.6 yeah. million. The part that I care about a lot here that we should point out is this paragraph where they talk about when they expand it into different areas. I care a lot about like different changes in what they're doing. The thing that always scares me about insurer, and we talked about insurer once that a lot of people like, um, it's a Nordic insurer. I won't say the name of it, but a lot of people like it. And I just kind of backed away from it and didn't investigate it too much. And the reason was they, kept changing what they were doing. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. They might be very smart and know that there are certain, like other people have pulled back from a certain market and so they can go in and the premiums are priced in a way that's attractive. You know, Berkshire did a lot of uh, catastrophe risk stuff and then they did like super cat stuff and then they didn't at other times. But I am, I would rather much more see companies that like um, have been in certain states for a while and have been in certain uh, writing certain lines of business certain types of things without changing that a lot because of the predictability of it right going yeah. forward yeah. yeah and there's actually statutory stuff that you can find to see like what their losses are in California versus Texas and stuff it can actually be pretty different by state so you know True. Um, that's something to be aware of yeah are insurance companies rated B yes so AMS? that's not very good um, it's not ready to be anymore. It's been upgraded since that by AM Best. AM Best, so like you're used to like bond ratings, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're used to like S&P, Moody's, and Fitch, yeah. right? Well, in insurance, there's just AM Best. That's it. So you find the AM Best report, and I always do this. So for any insurer, one of the first things you do is find the AM Best report. When was the last time they were upgraded, downgraded, whatever? Why? And AM Best gives an explanation for that. So like now they would give an explanation why they upgraded them to uh, they're at B plus, I think. Um, I think they're B plus positive. I don't remember. Uh, so they would say the positive or negative or whatever. And um, a bunch of their competitors, I would say, are A minus. Uh, I'd say anything less than A minus, you might want to pay attention to. Got it. Yeah. Okay, our business model, insurance subsidiaries. Yeah, so they talk about their independent agents. So that's yep. the entire way that they do it, through uh-huh. 4,800 agents. And they also do it through an insurance broker. Yeah, it, it, which is just in uh, one state. If uh-huh. remember, right? Yeah. Insurance operations, the following table sets forth our gross premiums written by region for the peers indicated. Mm-hmm. Southeast, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina is their biggest market. This yes, is back in. That was back again, then. Texas has become very big to them, yeah. I was going to say, Texas is the second yeah. one. They have an office in Miami and an office in uh, Dallas. Mm-hmm. That's it, yeah. Okay, talking more about that. What you write here? 2010, Gaines Co. What does that say? Less than 1%. Market share in each state they operate in. That was my estimate that they're less. I mean, actually, that's not my estimate because they say it right there. Yeah, but I think it's good. Yeah, so it's they do say it, but it's always good things to think through when you're you know reading through. I mean, like look what you did. I mean, remember when we um, we took a look at Domino's Pizza mm-hmm. and you did something with like <laughs> pizzas to like the market cap. Yeah, and it's kind of. I mean, the whole time you're thinking it's just like what you just did with Texas and how like what's the potential opportunity right what do you pay how many drivers are there in Texas you're always constantly thinking of the big picture yeah and that's really important for things like their growth going forward sometimes people give estimates that they look at and go well that's kind of I mean that's kind of crazy right Mm -hmm. so that happened in the internet era right where it was like so everyone in the world will be an America online subscriber or something yeah I mean like you get numbers like that whereas if you get a number that okay they only have to buy you only have to have so many customers buying you know 10% of the US has to buy like two pizzas from me every month or something I said you want to explain that so people that was a fun one (laughs) then you're like okay so that you know that makes sense um uh but yeah, no, no, I mean, that's what we did. They talked about, we talked, we looked at like prices of what the pizzas were and things like that and estimated how often people would have to be buying pizza, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, like how many pizzas they actually have to be selling and things like that. And here, you know, if we assume that non standard is like, um, let's say 20% of the market or whatever, right? Which we don't know exactly, but that would mean that they might have 5% market share. That's what I care about more is like, do they have 20% market share in a state or do they have like 5%? If mm-hmm. they have 5%, they could grow a lot and they did. They'd like doubled over the last mm-hmm. 10 years. Our industry, personal auto insurance, is the largest line of property and casualty insurance in the United States. Giving a little bit of a background, and obviously very good information to know. Non-standard insurance is intended for drivers who typically seek the minimum statutory coverage mm-hmm. limits required in the state in which they reside, and their driving record, age, vehicle type, or payment history may represent a higher than normal risk. Yeah. So, you know, more like, I guess, subprime type stuff. 
Um, yeah, and it explains that they pay higher premiums for similar coverage. Which which makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's see. The personal auto insurance industry has historically been cyclical. Going on, what'd you write here? Industry. <laughs> can't read your handwriting. I have no idea what that means. You know what that means? I, interesting points? I, I think it just says interesting point. Interesting point. Yeah. What was interesting? Uh, because it says that underwriting stands for preferred and standard companies become more restrictive, more insured, seek non-standard coverage, and the size of the non-standard market increases. Hmm. It's something similar to what happens with subprime. Mm-hmm. So while I'm saying that like one out of five drivers might be non-standard, yeah. what actually happens is the same thing with subprime is like, if you remember subprime mortgages, for instance, were a tiny part of the industry, and they became very big because they got less um, restrictive, right? So that they more people who normally shouldn't be getting regulation. Up, yeah, right? sure. So, um, uh, but I mean, just in terms of the c- competition, right? So the same thing would happen here. What was interesting here to me, though, is that um, the that you're having a shift between non-standard and standard that happens based on in part the behavior of companies writing in standard, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, we've in every single 10k podcast or video we've done, we always talk about little things that you look for. So if they talk about like we compete on price Mm -hmm. or, you know, the type of customers they have just to kind of get a feel for it. As you can see, Jeff underlined um, right here, they're talking about the retention rate. He says the rate of policy retention is lower than the retention rate of a standard and preferred policies. Uh, So just give you a general idea of the type of customers and we care, especially in insurance businesses, um, you know, the retention rate. It says approximately 50% of our customers keep their policies in force for the entire term of the policy. And of that, 50%, approximately 80% purchase a renewal policy from us. So 80%. That's that's only 40% right Uh there. So um, the the 50% thing is pretty shocking because I would guess the most common policy length they have is six months. They don't come out and say that. They say they could do one month, six months, or 12 months. I believe six months would be the most common. So that means that within six months, people are not paying. Which is the kind of thing that happens all the time with like um, yes, yeah, the prime subprime reason. auto and stuff. You have a large amount of defaults right away. Yeah, yeah. the primary reason that a policy lapses or is canceled is due to non-payment of premium yeah. installments. So, they, so they get it when they have to right away, but then that you have it. And like I said, cancel isn't really the right word for it. It's more likely that the people um, just don't pay, mm-hmm. right? So that's a huge part of it, and a huge part of pricing the policy is figuring out how many people are going to renew with you and stuff. Yeah. I've said that before that like one advantage Geico has over Progressive. I, I think overall Progressive has a slightly better business, um, but one advantage that Geico has over Progressive is that they have had higher renewal rates over time. Mm-hmm. You know, and for, that's been a problem for Progressive because of what part of the the customer base they focused on, right? They, you know, and bundling and all that stuff is all about trying to get people to retain them. I mean, there are some of the biggest insurers for auto insurance could have like ninety percent retention rates, and here we're talking about something that I'm saying is like forty percent. Mm-hmm. That's pretty shocking. So, which what does that tell you? It, it tells me it's that like sure. one you have to price it way higher, uh-huh. much, much higher. Because if you think about it, your expense ratios and things could be way higher than you would want. Because like Geico can afford to, and Progressive, can afford to spend a lot of money to get business in in the first year, and then they'll earn it back in year three and four and five. Like they could be unprofitable for years one and two, spending on advertising And stuff. they know they got you, right? Yeah, here they can't, because the retention, you could do the lifetime value of a customer, right? So 60% of it goes away after one year. That's totally different, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see. Our products since the first quarter of 2002, non-standard personal auto has been the only material line of insurance that we write. Yeah, so that was just because they have some stuff in runoff. So mm-hmm. I don't know if we wanted to discuss that, but that happens with insurers. Sometimes they have a, they have businesses in runoff sometimes, which means that they're no longer writing um, new risks in that business. But since they made promises, they still have to keep them. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes that means that past results from a long time ago, they still have to keep honoring, which means that mistakes that they made a long time ago could keep being a problem for them. It's really small here. It was small 10 years ago. It's like, it's gone now, so mm-hmm. it's not something we have to worry about. But yeah, you do always want to highlight the stuff that's in runoff. Um, they used to do uh, commercial stuff, so they used to not just be in uh, personal auto. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see. So you did, in 2008 and 2009, average premiums mm-hmm. were... Yeah, so I just calculated... It's like 1200 to 1300 right, a year. number of policies enforced divided by... Um, the, I mean, sorry, uh, the revenue divided by the number of policies enforced, gross premiums written. So, so uh, basically, that's like $1,200, $1,300. So I said it could be about $100 a month, the premiums. It's way more complicated than that. This was 10 years ago because there'd be all these fees and stuff that they'd add. Plus, we know that all these people are canceling and stuff. So who knows exactly? But I was trying to get an estimate of how much do I think they're... Um, the average customer is paying. Mm -hmm. And I was saying it might be something like $100 a month. Yeah. Okay. Going to their strategy, product focus strategy. We also attempt to focus our marketing efforts on segments we believe will result in higher renewal and retention rates. Obviously, Mm -hmm. they care a lot about that. 
Um, let's see. Yeah, so here they talk this. about they expect to introduce the method. So this is interesting, and I wondered if this changed things for them because they did change quite a bit after this. So beginning the second quarter of 2009, we implemented a new pricing technology in Texas, and they then expanded Texas a lot. So um, they, they talk about why they did this and what the point of it is. So they said their principal goal in doing so is to seek to attract customers whose risk characteristics will allow us to achieve a lower loss ratio, higher average premiums for policy, and higher rates of policy retention and renewal. So they did definitely achieve the lower loss ratio. That definitely happened. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting if they did that, and I want to know about why, you know, what, what if they were capable of doing something that uh, some of their competitors weren't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, service focused strategy. This is actually where they talk about uh, service staff speaks both Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. Let's see, whatever, what else they got. Oh, I also did a calculation of the number of calls per day and things like that. It's okay. not a big deal, but just so you can see there, that's what I'm doing with the call center. Mm -hmm. How many calls per day? How, what would that be per hour and stuff? Assuming you're open 24 hours, which you probably aren't, but you know, uh, although, well, with online, maybe not, but insurance stuff is often is open for you, at mm -hmm. least putting claims all the time. Talk about where the headquarters is. Yep. Dallas, Texas. Um, the majority of the great staff majority of the staff are bilingual. That's very unusual. So that's another reason why I thought they were very focused on. That's that. why you highlight it, like you yeah. or circled it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now they don't say how many of their agents are bilingual, but I would assume that a lot of their agents must be bilingual, or that they have a lot of agents who speak Spanish and mm -hmm. stuff. There's not a lot of discussion of that, but that was part of the uh, thing that I was interested in. Over 99 percent of our new businesses upload to us by agents via the internet. Mm -hmm. Yep. Again with 2020. There's Even though this was about, 10 years ago. So. There's a lot about <laughs> Spanish and English, speaking their preferred language, stuff yeah. like that. This is just because it's just like, um, you know, it's. I'm thinking that it's probably a bigger part of their business. Yeah, sure. Well, it makes they sense too in the, in the markets that they're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it might even be more of a niche than I'm thinking. So like I'm saying that, okay, they have 1% market share in those states back then. Mm -hmm. But then in non-standard, they might have 5%. But then how much is it in the Spanish-speaking population of non-standard? It could be pretty big market share. Mm -hmm. We don't know that's not 20% in that you know group. Yeah. Oh, and then they just talk about here. And uh, so they just wanted to have information about their uh, claim stuff. So they talk about how they save in the claims handling on complexity. And then they talk about how they have a special investigation unit, litigation specialist, stuff like that. Litigation is a very important category for an insurer. So like the litigation um, page, you know, which isn't the litigation section of a 10K, which isn't that interesting normally, mm -hmm. the legal uh, risks and stuff, is very interesting to get an idea of what kinds of things they could lose a lot of money on, you know. Okay. Product management technology. You didn't mm -hmm. highlight anything, so we could skip through. Okay. Uh, I just highlighted this because they're using an outside software thing. So can you read it? back then. Okay. So, so the claim system developed by Guidewire Software. So it is just a thing that they were doing and how much they charged them and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I just, it, that they weren't using, um, that they hadn't developed their own internally or something mm -hmm. like that. That's all I was interested in. They talk about reinsurance here. So we should maybe talk a little bit sure. about reinsurance. Maybe they explain what reinsurance is. Yes. It says a reinsurance transaction takes place when an insurer company transfers or cedes to another insurer a portion or all of its exposure. So they used to do a lot of reinsurance and it's gone down over time. If we go down here, we can see their reinsurance, I believe. Yeah. So we can see which companies uh, they were being reinsured by back then. Those were the, a lot of those are the big reinsurance companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, they talk about what they were doing. Uh, the big thing that changed, I didn't highlight it here, is that I think they were writing a lot of stuff in Florida and they wanted uh, reinsurance on catastrophe stuff. So they wanted to make sure that a single event in Florida, you know, mm -hmm. like a hurricane basically, um, wouldn't cause them to have uh, too high losses. And that would make sense because if you remember, their, their financial strength rating isn't that great, right? Their financial strength rating at this time, 10 years ago, was a B. Mm -hmm. B, from, yep. yeah, from A and Best. So they get someone else. These are usually companies that have like A uh, or higher. Um, to reinsure them. So it's passing on that risk to someone else. Yeah. Um, Talking about the reserves. Mm -hmm. What yeah, is so the reserve for insurance company? Well, we can get into that. So if we move down, I think they'll get into details of it, I hope. Yeah. So this is incurred but not reported, which is maybe kind of a complicated thing to explain. Um, 
they may explain it in words. I will try to do so. So at any point in time when they prepare their balance sheet and stuff, right, there is two things that could have happened, right? The insurer has written, they've made a promise that they will uh, cover people for different things, yeah. right? So at certain times, at any time, a balance sheet is a moment in time sort of thing. Well, at that moment in time, no matter what moment we're talking about, there have actually been accidents that they don't know about yet. And on top of that, there have been things about that accident that they don't know about. So um, they're basically, there's stuff where people haven't put in claims yet, but it's already happened that they need to, uh, that they basically have the loss for it. So if you're matching up the loss with the um, revenue, which is what you do with gap and stuff, right? Then there's always this thing where they need to have a reserve for the fact that there's um, events have occurred that they don't know about, or the severity of the event is greater than they know about yet. There's just facts that they don't know yet, but they have already happened. And so the way that the accounting works is you don't do it based on when they know what has happened, but you do it by assuming, uh, and this is what they do, they do this calculation. And I think they talk about it, um, if you go down, like what models they use and stuff. Okay, so if we see here, let's see. Um, let's see, we'll keep going, keep going. We'll just finally, yeah, here we go. So this is the more interesting part, I would say. Um, this is a very important part of uh, an insurer's uh, 10K or whatever you're getting from it, which it has to do with their reserves. So I talk about the combined ratio a lot. The combined ratio is what they're actually reporting, but then what's happening with reserves is that you have this thing happening where the reserves, uh, you could end up, so here we go. They're talking about how they... Um, originally thought that they would lose however much and then later it comes out to be a different number mm -hmm. and so if we go down i think it's actually the next table that will be most interesting to us for that purpose if you keep going down probably maybe i'm wrong let's see um is this the one that we want let's see That's yeah as originally estimated net unpaid claims okay so um if you keep going, let's see if you keep going. I think we'll get to what I want. Okay, so we can talk. Okay, so I don't know what section that'll be in. We have another thing that will also help us with the um, uh, reserves that we can look at. But um, this is the combined ratio. So that was what I was explaining. So in 2008, 2009, you can see their expense ratio was 26% in each year. And their um, their loss ratio, which is what the first thing is they'll explain to you, um, it was 73% and 74%. So their combined ratio was right around 100 in both cases, like 99 to 100. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing that we get here, and this is what I was talking about with Berkshire, has to do with their um, uh, premium leverage, basically, their underwriting leverage. So if we go down there, you can see what I'm talking about. They wrote um, 1.9, they think they said, yeah. So their two to one, basically, ratio of their premiums written versus their um, surplus. Okay, so explain that. Okay, so say they have a certain amount of equity, basically. I'm gonna say equity and stuff to think of it in gap basis, because that's what people are used to hearing about. There are some differences between gap and statutory, but we're not gonna worry about it. So let's say I have a $100 million book value, right? Mm -hmm. and so I have shareholder equity of $100 million. If I write $200 million of premiums, then my leverage is two to one. Mm -hmm. So the, why that's important is if I have a combined ratio of 105, then I lose 5% of my premiums. That's 10% of my equity, right? Mm -hmm. If it was three, which is gonna be the maximum that you're gonna see insurers do. Um, if it was three, I'd lose 15%, right? So if we look at the, can we look at the article that I did for Focus Compounding to see why that's important? So let's just look at the combined ratio that they had, okay? There are years when they used to do other business that was very unsuccessful mm -hmm. in the 1998 through 2004 is where they changed. Yeah, so, so their combined ratio in 1998 was 134%, 1999, mm -hmm. 99%, 2000, 124%, 2001, 163%, 2002, 143%, 2003, 105%, 2004, right. 97%, and then it starts at right. 95. Right, it starts to change. Now, yeah. the worst year that they had after changing their business model was probably uh, 2006. Yeah, uh, which was 108%. 108%, but then after 2009, uh, from 2011 to 2018, just for people listening, it was 99, 103, 99%, 96%, 99%, 99%, 94%, 94%. Yeah. So the important years there are like 2012 and 2008, uh, I'm sorry, 2006, they had a combined ratio of 108% in one of those years and they had a combined ratio of 103% in another year. So if you're leveraging that up two times, that's a 16% loss of your equity mm -hmm. in one of those years. And in the other year, it's like a 6% loss. But you have to be 
prepared for that. So the amount of leverage that you have in underwriting is sort of like the amount of leverage that we might see for like a, a, talking about a bank or something. Yeah. If they lose a certain amount on a loan, how much does that actually hit equity? Mm-hmm. And so why something like Berkshire can invest the way they do is often having very low amounts written in, in premiums versus um, the amount of surplus that they have. Okay. So they're, they're doing a small amount of um, risk taking on an underwriting basis versus their equity. It's important because I invested in an insurance company once where this was a very big factor. They had a huge loss. I forget if it was like 25% of equity or something, and that's after tax, right? So oh, a huge wow. loss in a business they hadn't been in before. They went into it, they had a huge loss, and then they got out of it, right? So a big part of it was what will their return equity be coming out of this? Now, historically, it might have been like 10% or something. But what you realize is if they were writing about $1 worth of premiums, for one dollar of surplus that they had or a little bit less or something before this happened well then they can just keep writing the same level of premiums even if they had a 50 percent loss to their equity right Mm -hmm. it would be devastating for a lot of companies most insurers or a lot of insurers would have to pull back what they were doing but this company wouldn't because they would now be able to keep the same level they just would go up to being a two to one leverage ratio right but you look at a company like this two to one i said they're not going to go over three to one that's not going to happen so two to one if you lose 50 percent of your equity you have to cut back on your premiums you can't do the same level of business because you can't be suddenly writing four to one so it's very important because you can see that insurer can suddenly make a lot of money after a loss if they have a lot of capital, but they can't if they don't have that capital because that capital base is what is going to determine how much they can do in terms of premiums. So it's sort of like how far they're like when we talk about banks, if they're overcapitalized or undercapitalized and things like that. Yeah. So when you're how much you're doing in premiums versus your equity, I don't know if you want to think about like how much you're doing in loans versus your equity or something like that, but it's in that same neighborhood of okay, if you had a loss, would you have to pull back? And if you're at two to one, you might. But if you're at one to one, you won't. And if you're at half to one, then you definitely won't. Like mm-hmm. Berkshire could have a big loss and then the very next year up. Go to two to one. Yeah, they yeah. could increase their premiums. I mean, they could take in more risk because a lot of the industry would be pulling back at them, mm-hmm. you know, and that's how you can do that. Yeah, and as you could see for the most recent years, it being 96, 99, 99, 94%, 94%. Mm-hmm. That's why you title it a dark non standard auto insurer that's cheap based on recent underwriting right. results. It's the recent results, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's go back to here. Okay, okay. perfect. So two to one ratio. So that's a very important number, yeah. But that's pretty common for all I was going to say, what's though. common? What yeah, I think I, My guess is Geico does that. Uh, progressive does like... Th- progressive takes a lot of underwriting risk. Progressive does like that, but then Progressive also has debt, so I'd say even more uh, risk overall. Mm-hmm. But they're rated higher in terms of like AM best and stuff. They take like no um, uh, investment risk, mm-hmm. you know. Um, investment portfolio. Yep. This so this is, is where I highlighted. They're all in corporate bonds, basically. Back then, they were in some mortgage-backed things and stuff. They've changed that. That's because that was like the financial. Yeah, crisis. back in the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this is. I don't know, pretty typical for insurer. Insurers like to be, especially insurer that's not rated that highly, like to be in bonds and shorter term bonds, which we'll get into. Um, they give you information about, there you go. So um, they give you information about how much, what percentages are in what uh, rated in what category. So mm-hmm. like a third is in AAA, which as it turned out with the financial crisis, not all that was great, <laughs> but usually your AAA stuff would be fine. And then you can just see how little of it was rated um, at a low level. I'd be concerned about things rated like... Um, where they have, I don't know. I wouldn't be concerned about any of the investments they have normally above like triple B or something. So I just wouldn't even think about those, like the things that are A rated and stuff. And you can actually find in the statutory stuff that we can um, do for this company now. We're not going to look at it. They literally show you every bond that they own. Yeah, every. I mean, how much is in each company and stuff. Mm. So they're taking way more risk now. I've said that about this company before. They're way more in like the very low end of investment grade. And there's some stuff I didn't like. Like I noticed that they own a bond of another insure in the same industry they're in. It's 1% of their portfolio. It's not a big deal. I just don't like that they did that. Well, that just tells you a lot about their capital allocation, right? The way they think about it. I think they did that because they want to take interest rate risk, which we can see here with duration. So you can look up on Wikipedia what duration means. I'm not going to explain it on a podcast because I feel like it's very complicated to explain. It has two meanings, basically. Uh, One is sensitivity to interest rate, to moving interest rates, basically. And the other is just uh, sort of the timing of the cash flows, the average rate. But what it means really is how far out you're going in terms of um, your uh, bonds Mm -hmm. that you own. So you can see here, they're very heavily in things that are like in the, uh, in 
things under one year could basically be cash, you know, like treasuries and stuff like that. But here you can see that they're very heavily in stuff that's less than five years. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they stuck to that. So like 10 years later, you'll notice their duration is very similar. I don't know if it's identical, but it's very, very similar. But what they did is they just took more credit risk. What do you think it like? What's, the standard in like progressive or other progressive is more conservative than anyone that I know of. I mean, I'm sure there's insurers. I don't know about that, but yeah. I like that way, but they're super conservative on that. While I'd say they're pretty aggressive on the underwriting. So they're aggressive in terms of underwriting leverage and they're conservative in terms of investment risk. Mm -hmm. They're like, like short term government, um, uh, bonds and stuff where something like Geico, we know is the opposite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Investment strategy. We manage our investment portfolio internally. Yeah, they I do have one Bloomberg terminal. Them, yeah, um, I don't know. And, and I highlight something that. because I don't know if I did here, but there had also been a thing where with one of their shareholders at one time, they're managing it for them. They had a shareholder who part of the agreement was that they had to let them manage their. Um, uh, yeah, and that just is detail on what it means. Mm -hmm. So just so you know, it says right there that it's the seventh of the sixteen possible ratings. It's yeah. very in the middle. It did improve since then, but. And, and again, this is not, uh, so people know, they're rating the financial strength in terms of policyholders. It's like uh, FDIC rating, uh, I'm imagining the FDIC was rating something for like protection for the depositors. Um, this is how safe it is to be a policyholder of the um, company. It is not how safe it is to be a shareholder necessarily, but it's a good indication. Mm -hmm. The same way that like being a shareholder in a company that's got a junk rating probably means that your common stock is pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. The same thing here. I mean, obviously, if the policyholders are in any sort of risk that they won't get um, <clears throat> paid, then you're in a lot of risk because they're a lot more senior than you. Okay, let's see. Employees, 394 full-time employees. Oh, yeah, the only thing I noticed is that there's no part-time employees, which is interesting. Uh, and then I just listed some uh, peers that I thought of because I wanted to learn more about them. Okay, comp, uh, risk factor. We face intense competition from other personal automobile mm -hmm. insurance providers. Infinity is the one that they own the bond in, I think. Um, we do not use credit scores in underwriting our policy, unlike yeah, many, I highlighted of competitors. That many of the competitors do. Yeah, that's very common to use. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. I know that some at the very low end for things, like for instance, Carmart, America's Carmart, doesn't use credit scores at all. They're super low in the subprime area, mm -hmm. and they may not find it helpful. Everyone in that area might have very bad credit scores anyway, and it's just not useful. I don't know that like FICO scores and stuff are really, I don't know that they're really meant to like give you a lot of information about super deep subprime stuff. I don't, I, you know, that's not really necessarily what they were designed for. I'm sure FICO would say they've worked on that and stuff and whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think that they're more for the um, more middle of the road and that sort of thing is helpful. These are probably people who can't really get access to credit in a lot of cases, you know, if they're missing a payment on there. Um, uh, there you go. So it talks a little bit about that, that 94% of their receivables to the reinsurers were with companies A- minus or better. So that's just a good indication that I had said the thing about A-. minus. I think that that's a pretty good indication that, like, you... Um, it just in general, if you want a rule of thumb, like sometimes I say, you know, if your company has more than three times debt to EBITDA, you know, yeah. pay attention to mm -hmm. it. Sure. It doesn't mean you can't do that. I mean, maybe a railroad could do that or something, but I'm just saying, like, pay attention. Uh, if you're looking at a show that's rated less than A minus, pay attention. If they're not, that's fine. Always read the AMBEST report, though, because mm -hmm. AMBEST will explain just like Moody's does or something. I, was say, I mean, it's just like reading a Moody's report, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they explain. like those, Or an say, auditor's report. There's concentration in those uh, states that are part of the risk, but their underwriting has been good, but they don't have a lot of uh, surplus capital or whatever. You know, they'll explain why. Mm -hmm. Okay, our business is subject to financial and operational risks resulting from our growth. You mm -hmm. circled that we limited our business in Florida until the fourth quarter of 2003. Mm-hmm. So I was very interested in that and South Carolina, uh, what those states are and how much they grew over time. Mm. And then it talks more about the financial strength, the downgrade. And that is true. I mean, I don't know details in this thing, but that's one of the risks is they can kind of like, um, um, you can sort of have a snowballing effect or whatever you want to call it, where getting upgrades and stuff might make your business easier in some ways and getting downgrades might make it harder. So um, I don't know how important that is for like personal auto stuff, but like for some other things, yeah, some companies might not want to do business and some agents might not do business with companies that have very poor financial strength ratings. Mm -hmm. Talking about the new pricing in Texas, which we talked about yep. before. Let's see. That's, yeah, so that's basically, um, <clears throat> it's not, 
it's not really the regulator, but it's an association of regulators, however you want to put it. So we will talk about the NAIC a lot because it's sort of like the standards are set by them. Keep scrolling. NAIC, let's see. So our executives and directors own a majority of outstanding capital stock and therefore exercise voting control over the company. Yeah, and this is the reason why I think the company chose to go dark. This is because, in the because it was already percent. owned mostly by those people and they probably didn't care if there was much of a trading market in their Sure. Stock. Yeah. Properties. Mm -hmm. Right by my apartment building. And then legal proceedings. Come find me. There's basically no legal proceedings that they have there. So... I mean, they have legal proceedings that are yeah. the normal ones, but they don't go into great detail about any cases. Now they do, if you look at the most recent ones. Hmm. And then I just highlight some things about how cheap the stock had gotten or how expensive and that sort of thing. So um, Let's get down to them. Yeah, so this gets into statutory surplus and all that stuff. So statutory surplus, I was saying comparing it to like equity value, and I think that's a good way of thinking about it, about book value. Um, there was an impairment because of uh, Freddie Mac, like we said, so or Fannie Mae, or both. Maybe both. Um, but normally, you know, AAA rated things and stuff would be fine. They need to be recapitalized because you'd seen those combined ratios that were really bad. Yeah. Uh -huh. and so they, they recapitalized them and they moved into different kinds of businesses. That's kind of what was interesting. Or they focused on, sub, on um, uh, non standard auto, especially in Texas and South Carolina and some other states. So that it, it's basically the history of the company. Discontinuance of commercial lines. Oh, that's just crossed out because it doesn't matter. It's 10 years later that's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Results of operations. Gross premiums are in 2009 decreased 1% as compared to 2008. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Obviously, since this is 10 years ago, I wasn't that interested in like year by year results um, as being that important to it. I wanted to learn more. And we'll pull up a more recent one. Yeah. So, what we could do with that is probably pull up like what the report that they have now. Will probably be most useful. So, we so could, if you go to Gaines Co. Auto, mm -hmm. uh, you type it in and you go to their uh, historical financial reports and filings. This is what you'll see. Right. So MGA is the name of the um, insurance company. Uh, their insurance subsidiary. subsidiary. Yeah. yeah. So, and independent autos, auditors reports. So we should point out that like, so there isn't a perfect match in the sense that if we're looking at the books for MGA, MGA is not Gainsco. Gainsco could have assets and stuff that MGA doesn't have and things like that. It's like when we talk about Berkshire yeah. and their stock portfolio. Mm -hmm. So if we looked at the stocks that they own by looking at each of their insurers, I think that would only add up to like 90 some percent of their stocks. They own a tiny little bit of their stocks outside of those, like the like some other part of Berkshire owns it. So the same thing can happen here where if you're looking at the um, at just the statutory thing, you could be missing some things, but there'll also be the gap one that we can look at, which covers things besides just the MGA stuff. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are at. Let's see. So these are the balance sheet. Yep. Now, one thing that's a little different is because this is a statutory report, there's admitted assets and then there's non-admitted assets. I think that's the term they use. Okay, now what's the difference between those? <laughs> it's just the regulator deciding whether you can count the assets or not towards okay. your statutory surplus and stuff like that. So what that means is there's just some stuff you could own that isn't actually counted. Um, same sort of thing could happen with a bank, kind of. So it's overwhelmingly going to be admitted assets, though. So you can see here what's admitted, right? So even stuff like common stocks and stuff is counted there. So um, their total invested assets they give there. And you can see uh, uh, the bonds. And we also have, um, so that whole front page is admitted assets. They have $332 million in admitted assets. And... Um, then we can look at the liabilities that they have to get an idea of the surplus. So total capital and surplus is 109. So we can do a few things there, right? So we can divide the total liabilities and capital and surplus, which if you remember like how the counting identity uh, equation works and stuff, basically that number is going to be your, um, your assets plus your equity are going to be 
uh, we're going to give us your total assets. I should say your liabilities plus your equity are going to be your total assets. Mm -hmm. So those two numbers over each other you're used to seeing is if we flip it, so we put that other number on top, 332 over 109, we're getting a number that's like three times, right? So overall, they have like three times leverage. And we know a lot of that is from the underwriting leverage, right? Mm -hmm. But there's float there and stuff. So it's basically three times leverage. So the return on their assets is going to be multiplied three times positive or negative to hit you in the equity. Um, and so you only have to earn like an 8% return on your assets, right? To be able to get like a 24% return on equity or something like that, right? Same way that we do that all the time for banks, right? I always say like a bank, you know, oh, it's 10 times. Mm-hmm. And eyeballing it here, it's like three times. Yeah. And then if we look here, we can see the underwriting gain. And this is how you can calculate like things like the combined ratio for yourself if you wanted to. You can see that most of their income is coming, I'd say about 75%, right, from underwriting. So you can see that their net investment income is that line down there. Mm -hmm. And then their underwriting gain is above that. And it's way more um, towards underwriting. So their capital and stuff is important because that is going to determine how much they can write in premiums. That's probably a big factor in how much they can choose to grow, I would guess, because they're probably staying right around that two times ratio. Uh So if now you'd have to do some scuttlebutt in the company and whatever to figure it out. But if they can grow, right, just like when we talk about a bank, if they can grow, the only thing stopping them from growing is their return on equity. So like they could grow their premiums 10 to 20% a year if their equity is also compounding at 10 to 20% yeah, a year. Because it, it should have to go down if, if not. But if it's yeah. not, then they can't because this company probably doesn't want to increase their underwriting leverage, mm-hmm. their amount of premiums that they're writing because they're at a level, like we saw with the financial strength and whatever, they're not in a position where they're overcapitalized. What's the market cap on this company? Uh, about 150 million, I think. Got it. Um, so then they currently have net income of about 24 million, which is very cheap. Yeah. Right. So it's very, very cheap. However, um, the catch is, uh, well, yeah. So like book value, we'll just use the statutory surplus instead of book because this is a statutory report. But it was 109, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 109. Yep. 109. Um, versus, like I said, 150, let's say, their market cap is, it would be like 1.3 times or something, times book. Uh So, you know, if they can earn, like for Progressive, I'd love to buy Progressive at 1.3 times book. That would be an amazing purchase. I was going to say, so what's like, amazing purchase. For people, because a lot of people always ask these questions. I mean, what would be, you know, interesting multiples to pay for like a business like, um, like Progressive, for example, right? Yeah. They get a great insurer. What's their retention rate, you know, right. and their capital ratio? We were just talking, you know, right. it's a great business. Uh, unfortunately, the only way to do it is to figure out how much you think they're going to make on the investment side and how much on the underwriting side. So the problem is, as you can see, in the last like 10 years or something, they only had one year where they had an under- underwriting loss. So... If I believe that, then I could pay a pretty high uh, price to book, right? Because but what's what's that? Well, so maybe okay. So if you were earning twelve to thirteen percent return on equity every single year, then the stock probably wouldn't underperform other stocks, even if you paid two times book. Really? So like, let's say 15%. If you could earn a 15% return on equity all the time, then two times book isn't too much to pay for. That's 7.5%. You know, you're taking the return on equity and then you're dividing mm-hmm. the price to book. But it really depends for an insurer like this on you have to separate the underwriting portion from the investment portion. And so the underwriting portion is the problem here because um, like, let's say they have a combined ratio of 94 now. Right? Yeah. Uh-huh. That means they have an underwriting margin of 6%. Yeah. Well, a lot of insurers and them in their own history has been like 99%. Yeah. So that means I think that there's going to be like an 80 to 90 percent decline yeah. to normal earnings, mm-hmm. or what they've it's going to go back up to years, like 99 percent, right? Yeah. Or what they've done in the last three years is correct. Is a new because, business, yeah. right? If they had a combined ratio of 100, the only thing you'd have is the investment income. Mm-hmm. So you'd instead be buying a company at 150 million dollars, making eight million. Mm-hmm. Or if they keep at this 94 combined ratio, you're buying something that's making 30 million a year at 150 million. Yeah. That's amazing. Much better. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But it depends, and that's why I said you know it depends on the cyclicality of it. There aren't a <laughs> lot of non-standard auto insurers that consistently have been doing 94 percent combined yeah. ratios, and this company had it in its history. However, there have been some, and like Progressive early on in its history had an amazing record, and it grew to be a, a huge company. And everything. So. I mean, is there like additional scuttlebutt you can do? That's to- what you have to do. Why is this happening? Why is the? I mean, so just to give an example, the loss ratio has gone down from it was in 2011, 2012, 2013. It was 72 percent, 78 percent, 72 percent. It's now 65 percent, 64 percent. 
So that's the entirety of the, the, the improvement. That's all of your underwriting gain is coming from the improvement in the loss ratio. The expense ratio has actually gone up a couple percent. Mm -hmm. So there's been a change in terms of their um, losses versus their premiums. So, so the why is they're underwriting is it because it? there's like a hard market or, you know, in insurance? Is it because their competitors are pulling back and stuff? Is it because everyone's doing well in the market? Is it because of the specific states they're in? Is it because of something that they changed about their model mm -hmm. that's more successful now? And if it's a niche that's successful that way, if they are actually have an underwriting uh, advantage in you know in Texas and South Carolina with Spanish speaking drivers who are non-standard, I mean if that's like accounting for a lot of their underwriting um, gain, yeah, that could be something that they have a you know they could have a better mousetrap, they could have a better understanding of that market than other yeah. competitors, and then that that could continue. And if it does, then you have a company that could grow 10, 20 percent a year, yeah. For ten years or something, sure. The only thing stopping them really is their um, their their equity and stuff. You know, the the regulation, the amount of premiums they're willing to write versus mm -hmm. um, their surplus. And if surplus is going up ten or twenty percent a year, then you know you're doing fine. So it's similar to a bank that way. If they have a better you know uh, way of um, making money. Uh, yeah, so they have uh, they bought back stock. So that's interesting. Yeah, but they bought this is a illiquid overlooked stock. Yes, and they're buying back their stock. They bought back stock, but they also gave stock to insiders. Uh, so it's just yeah. A, so sort it's of offset. basically offsetting, mm -hmm. and so I will, that's a huge issue here with this company. Um, they gave like I don't know eight percent or something of the company away in the last couple of years, but they hadn't been giving away any before. So I don't know if I should think that like there should be a permanent drag of like 4% on the stock where yeah. that won't happen at all. That was like a sort of a one-time thing or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's unclear. And also they were in amazing years for the company. I mean, the return on equity was amazing in those years. Mm -hmm. um, Let's go through the cash flow statement of an insurance company. Okay. Because then I could just put going through a cash flow statement of an insurance company and clickbait everybody. <laughs> all right. <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> Okay, so premiums collected net of reinsurance. Yes, so to understand that, that means premiums is the money that comes in from policyholders. Yep. And then net of reinsurance is because you seed that to reinsurers, which mm -hmm. means you give it to them yeah. even though you collected it yourself. Yeah. Is reinsurance in general, do you think, a pretty good business? No. Why is that? <laughs> I think it's a worse business than insurance. Generally. Really? Why is that? You have to have high amounts of capital. I think it's even more cyclical. Um, I think it attracts people for the possibility to generate float. Yeah. Um, I think there's just a lot of, um, the thing about insurance is that it's so easy to like, if it, this is banking's the same way, all this insurer has to, all any insurer has to do is just make a promise. Like I think Buffett said, like all it takes is a pen. All you just, that's <laughs> yeah, all you have to yeah, do. yeah. Yeah. So if it, the capital and a pen, you know, so if they have, if someone has $300 million and the willingness to take on, uh, a risk, then they can do it. And then it's just a question of how, dumb or how smart they are. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if other people are pretty dumb, um, then you're not going to get a lot of business unless you are, you know, pretty equally dumb. So it, it's just the cyclicality of it is extreme in how easy it is for your competitors to cause you to do things you wouldn't otherwise want to do. You think reinsurance is like the fund to fund businesses? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're I, investing in a fund to fund that invests in, you know, other managers and stuff like that. Yeah. Insurance. Yeah, I mean, take I, on the risk that in, other insurance companies take on. <laughs> in theory, reinsurance controls a lot of, a reinsurance control, a lot of capital mm -hmm. and they have the ability to invest. Well, that's why it's attractive. Yep. To them. Yeah. And there've been some cases with that. Like there's right, there's green light. What's the other one? There's another one that, uh, similar is, you know, uh, reinsurance with, um, uh, an investment business basically mm -hmm. built into it, investing in stocks. Where's he run that company out of? I forget. It's, it's off. Uh, is it Bermuda? Yeah, Bermuda. Yeah, Most insurers right. or insurers yeah. will pick Bermuda. Why do they do that? Uh, <laughs> well, there's a bunch of reasons. One, they is must really like the they ocean. don't have to pay the taxes <laughs> there. Yeah, beautiful place. Beautiful place. Okay. Uh, cash from investments, proceeds from investments sold, matured, or repaid. Yeah, that's Bonds. the complication. So, I mean, that's, of course, why this isn't that useful. Because you could have sold those bonds or you could they could have matured. Uh -huh. But to understand, this is a good example of the maturity thing is that, okay, so if you have 100, they have 200 some million in bonds. If you have that much in bonds, then the just amount maturing every year, which is what you see there, is um, going to be 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year coming off of it. So that's why they do that. So they have those cash flows. So those cash flows are available to pay mm -hmm. um, for the, the uh, losses that they'll have. So you can see that net actually they you know acquired more bonds than they uh, than came off. Mm -hmm. You know, so their bond portfolio grew, which you could see from the balance sheet mm -hmm. too. Yeah. And then they have the dividends thing. The dividends thing is a little complicated for an insurer because we're seeing the statutory thing for the insurer. They kick the dividends up to the 
uh, parent company and there's regulation on that. This company is fine with that, but like, um, there's a certain maximum that you'd be allowed. There's usually, I think it will be two things, which is like how much you earned and also like how much of your uh, surplus it would be. Mm -hmm. So like you can't pay out everything in one year or something. When thinking about the most important like factors, I guess, of investing in an insurance company, what are those? Well, like if, what's most important? If we things? keep going, I want to see the reserve triangle. So if we can keep going for the most be, recent one, yeah. So it should be in this report. I'm hoping. Um, yeah, so that's their balance sheet. Um, hoping they could read this too. By the way, I don't know if I should zoom up. <clears throat> So anyway, um, the, I would say that one of the most important parts is the reserves that you'll see. And the thing with it, similar to banking the same way, but yeah, um, really we're doing this off one year, but I would never like analyze and share much off one year. I would look at a history of, um, how, what the combined ratio has been historically, what has been happening with reserves over long periods of time. I'm talking 10, 20 years. That's why it's hard to find something that there just is a new business mm -hmm. and, um, and make decisions based on that. So I have a hard time. So you can see their geographical distribution here at least. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, Texas and South Carolina together are half the business. Texas, South Carolina, and Florida together are uh, two-thirds of the business. So um, that's probably one of the reasons for the low financial strength rating. And Best will usually give you a lower rating if you're it, so there you go. So you can see the actual bonds and stuff that they hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if it's in this report that we would have. It should be the reserves in the gap report. Um, to see reserve development. Do we pass it? All right. Let's see. Prayers written and earn. Yeah. So if you keep. Uh, it should be somewhere in there that it has it. Um, so there they have detail in their legal proceedings. I don't know what it would be under, what the table would be saying, uh, you know, when searching for it, what it would say. But mm -hmm. um, let's see, do you have, um, is this the gap one or the statutory one? This is the statutory one. Do you yeah. want to go to the gap one? Sure. Okay. So go to the gap. Um, is that the 10K? Mm -hmm. No, go to the gap one for um, their Gainsco in Consolidated Gap Audited 2018. Okay, and let's see if we can find this. I'm hoping that we do. So just scrolling through it is probably the best way to do it. Um, Balance sheet. Yeah. Income statement. So if you just scroll through it, we'll should be able to see if they have it somewhere for me. Um, Cash flow statement. I know that I've seen it for this company, so mm -hmm. a recent one. So it's not just something that they only have put in the 10K. Um, so what we're talking about here is you'll see these reserves they show for, uh, or actually what I'm interested in really is how much they said they were going to lose in a certain year and then how much that actually t ended up being many years later. Um, because what will happen, depending on the company, is that they won't know all their losses right away. So I think I estimated for Gainsco that like they'll know 60% within a year, but 90% will be like three years. And there's still like 10% that could even be beyond that. So years four and beyond of the original year in which there was the accident year, basically. So um, an accident could happen this year. And some of the legal proceedings and stuff means that it won't actually be, um, they won't actually pay out the losses. Um, in some cases, like up to 10% of their losses total will be paid out four or five years from now. Whereas a huge part of it, of course, is, you know, of the simple things they talk about, they talk about the complexity, right? Mm -hmm. So the things that are fairly simple are going to be paid out pretty quickly. But this is stuff like determining who was at fault and if someone really had insurance and everything. There we go. Okay. Claims and claims adjustment. Yeah. Got it. So this is incurred claims and allocated claims adjustment expenses to never insurance. Okay. So you see the accident year on the left? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the accident year on the left is going to show you, and you see why I call it a triangle, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> so the accident year is going to be on the left, and then the actual um, year that you see next to it is going to be um, what they, what basically you're um, uh, reporting. Let's put it that way. So it, in 2009, it's as if they uh, had 126 uh, million 203 for that number, right? And then you go all the way over and you see if that number is rising or falling. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what happened with it? So you go, you know, 2018 is pretty definitive for that, and it was a lot higher, right? And so we see that, or it was higher. I think we see that through like 2011 or so. 
uh, if I remember this company. Where right. it being higher? Yeah, being higher. Yeah, so it was 99. Then, whether it's 2012 or what, it starts to shift. Um, yeah, I just mean in terms of the accident years. Yeah, so 99 million in 2011, and then in 2018, it was 112 million. Yeah, but what I mean is, so like, take 2010, uh, the first year, which is 2010, yep. was 102 million, and then it was 112 in 2018. Mm-hmm. And so then you see in 2011, you see 103 million, and then it was 107, right? But then you start to see a shift, I believe, later on, because if I remember right, we start to see some much lower numbers. Even numbers are lower, in fact, for several years in a row. Like, do we have any year afterwards that is meaningfully higher? No, they're all they're all less. Yeah. So explain that for people okay. listening and watching. So the way A and Best would describe that or whatever is like that those five years before that we're talking about, 2009 to 2013, had adverse reserves developments. So um, their original estimates were they were underestimating. So like their original estimates were lower than what turned out to be the case. Yeah. Sort of like a bank provisioning less for loan losses than actually turned out to be the case. But then later they're, um, they have positive developments in the sense that they are uh, saying that they have losses. This is a, remember the incurred thing that I was talking about before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they have losses that uh, end up being less than what they were talking about yeah. in the first case. So just to, to simplify, it's like provision for accounts receivable and stuff like that. Simple yeah. Concept. So to simplify it, really, is that I don't care so much about what those numbers are and what that means overall, because what it means for any one year, any whatever. But it's like an indication of management's conservativeness and um, things like that. Like going forward, if I have a combined ratio of ninety four or something, I have more faith in that. If I've seen ten years where they've tended to have uh, not had to strengthen their reserves. They've had t- tended to not have to say that, that what they reported originally isn't uh, turned out to be correct. Yeah. You know? So the, it, it, I don't know what you could compare it to other than like, so for many businesses you might see like cash flow, how similar free cash flow is to like earnings or something. Yeah. That's part of what we're talking about here. The actual numbers that we're looking at are going to be as reported could be overly conservative or overly optimistic because the company doesn't really know how much it's going to lose in 2009. Um, but in 2018, it does know how much it lost on accidents in 2009, basically. You know, I mean, you can see it turns into barely any differences, right? So by, I think, about 20, mm, 2013, it's getting smaller. But by 2015, there's no differences. So six years after the accident year, and I think that we're seeing that trend over and over with this company, six years after the accident year, they know. I mean, their, their estimates aren't off by anything after mm-hmm. that. So it's like no difference. So the, it's really a, an issue of like what happens. So if we're buying into the company today, we want to make sure that they're not saying they have a combined ratio of 94, but it turns out that actually they have a combined ratio of, you know, 101. Sure. Something. So, you know, um, it, it's useful to see that. And we like to see that... Uh, we like to see that number on the far right hand side being equal to or lower th- than the number that we're seeing on the far left, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's a cyclicality to it. If you notice, it tends not to be that they're, I mean, you see that all the time with insurers. It's not that they overestimated in one year and then they were underestimated and then overestimated and then underestimated. It's like three or four years in a row, they consistently were overestimating. Mm-hmm. And then three or four years in a row, they're consistently underestimating. It's very cyclical that way. And this is part of the reason probably why insurers as an industry is cyclical because their estimates were cyclical too. And so that's having an effect on premiums. They're only realizing later that they underpriced things or something like that, you know, hard question. But I mean, how would you go about then trying to figure out if, if, you know, the new, um, you know, numbers are what, you know, a good indication of the future. This is like, at this point you have to do Phil Fisher type stuff. You have to figure out why, yeah. Yeah. Why did their loss ratio go down with reserves, all that stuff. You have to figure out if this is something that's like general to the industry, if it's a cyclical thing or if it's something that they change things inside the organization. Is this situation when you thought about the value of it, where it's undoubtedly cheap, if Mm -hmm. it's going to be, you know, in the 96% area, uh, you know, going forward? Yeah. The, this is unfortunately one where if, if on the numbers, like to a value investor or whatever, yeah. it looks great. And if you just buy it on the numbers that it'll continue to do in the future, what it's done in the last couple of years, this will be an amazing stock. The problem is this is exactly what stocks that turn out to underperform yeah. and to disappoint look like. Yeah, sure. You're buying it at the best. They've never had literally, yeah. this is 64%, which is their loss ratio last year is the lowest loss ratio in the history of the company. 
Yeah. So it could be that they'll get to an even lower point, mm -hmm. but you are possibly buying the very highest peak earnings. Mm -hmm. That's the risk that you run. And you know insurance is a cyclical business. Sure. You know. All right, break it down, though. I want to okay. leave something with them. Okay. What are key things that you look for in insurance? This table that we have here is one thing that you should look for. Okay. okay? I would definitely always look at that. Always read the AM Best uh, report that they have and what the strength rating is, okay? Always look at the amount of premiums that they're writing versus their statutory surplus. Okay. So their leverage of two times, right? And then what is their what are they invested in? What does their portfolio look like? Right? Mm -hmm. So this is like lower uh, investment grade bonds that are pretty short term, right? And you look at those things together and then you have to make an estimate of how much do you think they're going to make from underwriting and how much do you think they're going to make from uh, in investment income, right? Mm -hmm. This is mostly about underwriting with this company. So like you asked about reinsurers and stuff, there could be somewhere that's the case, but there could be somewhere the investment part of it matters a lot. Here, the investment part of it it, it could be a risk at times because if they have impairments, then they can't, you know, they, they won't be able to write the same amount of premiums and stuff really. But... Uh, basically I would be really, really focused on the underwriting here, not the investment side of it. Usually I think with an insurer, I'd mostly be focused on the underwriting. Mm -hmm. I can't think of many cases where I'd be like, um, focus more on the investment side of it. Yeah. Even though I know that's a part that's very attractive to investors thinking about the float and everything that they have and it contributes here. I would spend, I don't know, 80, 90% of my time on the underwriting side, probably 90% of my time on the underwriting side and 10% on the investment side. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself. This is my Twitter, our Twitter that I control at Focus Compound <laughs> on Twitter. Be sure to follow me, tweet a lot of stuff. Um, join the Gannon Gazette that goes out every single week. This is a PDF version, but you could go to focuscompound.com and enter in your email for free to receive this in your email box. Uh, we will give away a free write-up every single time. Um, and this week was ARC Restaurants, lots of hidden value plus low liquidity plus no near-term catalyst equals excellent opportunity for patient investors. Uh, so definitely go and follow me on Twitter. That is at Focus Compound. If you're watching us on YouTube, help us hack that YouTube algorithm, leave us a comment, subscribe, hit that thumbs up button. All of it goes a very long way. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself. We are going to be in Omaha for the Berkshire meeting, the week of the Berkshire meeting. So if any potential investors would like to meet up with us, um, you know, we'd love to start that conversation. Reach out to me at Andrew at focuscompounding.com. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with us, and we will see you in the next podcast. Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along.